our world and beyond. Space, in partnership with the European Space Agency. Telstar receives its power from batteries that are recharged by the sapphire-coated solar cells. As it hurtles through space... It's exactly 50 years since satellite television revolutionized the way we can watch and share some of the most memorable events in history. OK, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. I think I was five years old. I was uh, in Canada, and it was the, the moon landing. So, you know, they would wheel in these big televisions into the classroom. And I sat on my sister's knee, and I watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. Now we watch events as they happen, and we do so via satellite. So the winds of change blow right through our TV screens. I'd been on a trip there in 1987, and when I saw those pictures of the Berlin Wall coming down, I didn't really believe it. I thought it would be quickly crushed, so they were pretty memorable pictures, especially after this trip to Berlin. Some of the record audiences are for sports events, and there's nothing bigger than the Olympics. In 64, we had the Olympics in Tokyo, which were uh, transmitted for the first time by a satellite. There was not a uh, big audience at that time. But, you know, the audience from the 60s still, uh, you know, our days uh, exploded, really, the audience. You had, uh, uh, in the Beijing Olympics, you had something like four, uh, more than four billion people watching, more than 60% of the world population watching this. Uh, and, of course, satellites were behind that. This year, yet again, the satellite messengers of the sky will swing into action for what some predict will be the world's largest ever media event, the London Olympics. The growth of the modern Olympics has happened hand in hand with the growth of satellite television. The four or five billion viewers don't just expect live coverage, they also expect to watch the games in HD and even 3D. And there are more channels featuring more athletes too. Today, you would not expect not to have live coverage of an event like the Olympic Games. Before, you had one event, one coverage, which was the same all over the world. Now, each uh, channel would have their own crew and would specifically follow the, the, the local uh, athletes and, and not have just one single feed. Hundreds of communication satellites in orbit are all constantly beaming down live TV images, including this program. So how does a big event hit our screens? Here in central London, engineers oversee a fleet of 11 communication satellites belonging to Imarsat. They monitor satellite beams and users all around the world. It's likely that during the Olympics, the London area will be declared a hotspot area and we'll pay particular attention to that. We expect a number of journalists which will make live broadcast uh, or video stream uh, interviews to, to the athletes or to the media. One of the cornerstones of modern live broadcasting is what's known as BGAN. These terminals were developed by Imarsat and the European Space Agency. When the news breaks, it often reaches your living room via BGAN. Yep, it looks good. What we're doing here is a live video feed by satellite, where my picture is taken by the video camera, and then from the video camera is portrayed back by the laptop to the BGAN terminal, uplinked over the satellite. The satellite is located at 36,000 kilometers above the Earth, and then from there gets relayed back to our ground stations in Holland, where then gets relayed back over the internet to London and back to the TV. Such technology means live events are really broadcast live. Uh, so here you can get an indication of the delay. Typically it's about uh, a second and a half. Um, broadcasters have a maximum tolerance of a two second delay. The reason for that is when you have a two way interview happening and you have the journalist in the field and the anchor in the studio, if you have more than a two second delay end to end, the two will end up talking over each other. 
star is set aloft from Cape Canaveral, atop a Thor Delta rocket and a joint industry government effort. It wasn't always this easy. Fifty years ago, satellite TV itself was making the headlines with the launch of Telstar. It left Cape Canaveral in July 1962, watched closely by engineers in the US. And once in orbit, Telstar began to transmit pictures. Pictures which found their way to a huge white dome on the coast of Brittany. Here we are inside of Radome, and I'm in front of a big antenna, the antenna of Plumeur Bordeaux, the telecommunications station that received the first transatlantic television image via satellite in July 1962, and the satellite in question was Telstar. The first ever moving image to be broadcast by satellite across the Atlantic was a shot of the American flag. The next day, the French engineers responded with their favorite crooner, Yves Monton. Ground stations were built in the US, UK and France as part of a joint project between public and private communication companies. The device developed to capture Telstar's pictures looks like a 340-ton ear trumpet. This is a pretty amazing spot because we're at the entrance to the cone. So imagine this is part of the receiver. So imagine the waves and then imagine the antenna pointing a slightly different way. And the waves come down to this reflector and then little by little go up to the end of the cone. Here we're in the upper cabin, it's the part where the signal is received. And you imagine at the end of this huge cone that we just saw, the wave comes from the United States and comes into this device. And you'll see the wave comes out of something really small. It's hard to imagine when you see the opening of the cone. Fifty years ago, spotting a satellite in the sky was like finding a needle in a haystack. And back in 1962, time was tight, as Telstar's fast low-Earth orbit meant it was only visible to the antenna in France for 10 minutes. This tracker behind me was designed to have a broad view of the area where the satellite was likely to be. And the information it gathered would be sent to a precision tracker that would then fine-tune the position and then give the precise point to the antenna. Despite the positive spin of the newsreel, not everyone was happy about the new satellite era. You find in the archives that there are certain governments, even in France, where there were people who said, no, we don't want pictures from the sky because we want to control those pictures. Seeking, searching. For around nine months, there was a huge building site here to build this antenna and be ready for D-Day on the 11th of July 1962 and receive the first television image from across the ocean. It was a really big event at the time because it was impossible with what was available at the time, be it undersea cables or shortwave radio, it was impossible to transmit a picture. Within a few years of the Telstar breakthrough, the satellite television industry began to take shape. These days, consumers can point their dishes to the sky and pick up pictures in a matter of minutes. And it's estimated 180 million homes worldwide now receive direct-to-home satellite TV. In the 70s, then, these receivers were developed, and then we had the satellite TV coming in the 80s. And I believe that the biggest boost in the satellite, uh, let's say, uh, uh, industry, and in particular satellite TV, was when we passed from the analog to the digital transmission and the development of the DBS standard, which is a, you know, a digital standard. This is a key uh, development that allowed satellites to transmit not only uh, one or two uh, you know, uh, channels, but uh, hundreds of channels. Nowadays, there are around 600 telecommunication satellites in operation. Most are in geosynchronous orbit 36,000 kilometers from Earth, meaning they appear in a fixed point in the sky. The European Space Agency leads research into how telecommunications develops, both in orbit and on the ground. 
a key trend is towards higher powered satellites and bandwidths that allow smaller antennas. 30, 40 years ago we were operating a lot in C-band and C-band we had these uh, huge antennas for transmitting and receiving so the, the big transmit antennas that were used at the, the telcos in, in each country were 20, 30 meters large, uh, huge. More recently, I guess in the last five, five years, we've started to look at KA band, and KA band allows your dishes to get even smaller. Uh, and you'll see some dishes can be even, you know, the size of a, of a big pie plate uh, in KA band. But this dish here, for example, just about anywhere in Europe, you can get high speed internet. The antenna in Brittany continued in service until 1985. The TV revolution that began with pictures beamed to Europe from the US has also transformed the events themselves. Without the satellites, the Olympic Games or the big events like the football, you know, World Cup, etc., wouldn't be what they are. Clearly, clearly, the satellite brought the event to your house. And as modern communications become more mobile, so the satellite systems respond. Satellites can be involved in broadcasting directly to your home television. It can be used to broadcast to a TV which is broadcasting a terrestrial television. It could be broadcasting to a, a cell tower, a 3G or 4G cell tower, which then rebroadcasts it to your cell phone. So satellites, whether you know it or not, are being involved in many of these activities uh, where you're getting broadcast, uh, broadcast television. We have a detected Satellites may face competition from fiber optics for internet and telephone calls, but when it comes to reaching a truly global audience, they are unique. Andover is dead on target. <laughs>